He's calling. He's calling. Answer. No, don't mute. Answer. What? How? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a hang-up thing. End call. Wait, is he on? Wait. Is he... <laughs> so confused. <laughs> Holy cow, it's just Skype. This is the AT Banter Podcast, a balanced and entertaining look at assistive technology, accessibility, and its importance in people's lives. Join Rob Minot, Ryan Fleury, and Steve Barclay as they banter with people around the world about anything and everything regarding assistive technology and the disability community. Now, on with the show. Hey, and welcome to yet another episode of AT Banter. Banter, banter. I am Robin O, and today I am joined by Steve Barkley. Yes, you are. And Ryan Flurry. That's me. And uh, that's it. That's it for today. That's all you get. That's it. Oh, <laughs> thanks man. For, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, Good thanks. Bye. <laughs> oh, so uh, I'd ask how the weekend was, Steve, but uh, you probably have a little, little some 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 black parts of the weekend, eh? <laughs> I I have some uh, some definite fuzzy memories around that party. Yep. Yes, it was Steve's fiftieth birthday party. Yeah. Uh-huh. And why don't you describe to the fine folks what you did? Well, we had a uh, combination of a super soft birthday party and a foo-foo drinks party. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a super soft birthday party is, it is uh, something that came up on the show Letter Kenny, uh, which if you have never watched the show Letter Kenny, it's about a bunch of uh, folks out in Letter Kenny, Ontario, uh, and it is absolutely hysterical. It is funny as hell. Uh, great dialogue, um, uh, just just a really really funny show. Totally totally so Canadian. Um, <laughs> yep. And uh, uh, in the third episode, I believe it is of Letter Kenny, they have a super soft birthday party for one of their friends. Uh, story goes that he had a or sorry. Story goes that that this brother and sister had the strictest parents on the planet and they would not allow them to have birthday parties. So they always doubled down on their friend Daryl's birthday party. Um, and Daryl's mom used to throw him the super softest birthday parties. You know, he would have, you know, cupcakes and, and unicorns and things like that. A lot of pink. And, uh, after their parents passed, the uh, brother and sister carried on the, uh, the super soft birthday tradition every year for him, uh, despite his objections. And uh, so we had uh, we had a little bit of that. We had a little bit of uh, cupcakes, and uh, my wife went out and got a chocolate fountain and a candy floss maker. Although I don't think she ever did pull those out over the course of the night because everybody was too loaded <laughs> to operate anything like that. <laughs> Which brings in the fufu drinks portion of it. This is something my wife and I have been doing for years. The fufu fufu drinks party is a celebration of the effeminate beverage. Uh, anything that you can put a fruit skewer in or a uh, umbrella is uh, is allowable. Um, typically, beer and the likes of that, uh, you're going to have to very least stuff an umbrella into the can if you're, uh, you're going <laughs> to yeah. walk around the party with it, as very I had important. to do at one point. Uh, so yeah, uh, and because there's a lot of mixed blender drinks and uh, drinks with fruit and stuff in them, people tend to get a little blotto. Yeah, as I may have. <clears throat> there, there just might have been little, witnesses. Just a little, just a little. Yeah, a room full of witnesses. <laughs> yeah, it's like fifty witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> but a good, hi- good, a good time was had by all, but all but one. And that was that's important. And no unicorns were harmed in the that's in true. The making yes, of yes. This birthday party. Yeah, indeed. So yeah, so uh, Saturday night was pretty much a write off, and uh, Sunday morning. Uh, my wife said, oh, I'm going to drive our friend home to White Rock, which is like an hour's drive away. So, you know, minimum two-hour turnaround. Oh, and they were going shopping, too. <laughs> so, you know, minimum four-hour turnaround. 
No, so she, she obviously didn't have enough to drink that night. <laughs> well, more importantly, she left her hungover husband, whose birthday it just was, to clean the house. Yeah. <laughs> Which happened probably nice. around 4 p.m. the next day. No, no, I was, I was up at a reasonable hour because yeah. we, had, uh, we had folks over still. Right? Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, so, yeah, I survived it, but uh, I've been on the wagon ever since. <laughs> yes, all, all four days. Yeah. <laughs> four days on the wagon. That's right, and it's killing me. <laughs> killing me. Anyways, we digress. As we we've, do. We've digressed. Uh, hey, Ryan. Rob. What are we doing today? Today we are speaking with a gentleman from a company called Wearworks, which is haptic technology once again. Oh, cool. I love haptics. It seems to be a theme. Yep. You know, haptics is one of these technologies that's been around for quite a while. Uh, just been... nobody's found the magic sauce yet. Yeah, r- exactly. Yeah, I mean, I've seen various attempts of it over the years. I mean, when I first started with Aroga, you know, 25 years ago, there was a fella over in Victoria who had a, uh, a device from New Zealand. I believe it was from New Zealand that was an ultrasonic, um, uh, a head-worn ultrasonic device with vibration. I repaired it a couple of times because it, it got damaged fairly easily. The little connections broke on it. Um, but, um, you know, it was it was ultrasonic, so it was good up until it was raining. Right. As soon as it was raining, it wasn't very effective anymore. And then other people have tried infrared. Infrared is great up until there's glass. Then it doesn't work. Right, <laughs> So right. you go cloon into the glass. Um, so yeah, um, the, the, that, that technology, that, 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 uh, I, I call it range finding technology. That's probably the, not, not the right word for it, but that, that sort of technology is, is fraught with peril. Let's, let's put yeah. it that way. And it doesn't really seem to improve much over the past, say 20 years, really. No, no, it really hasn't. Um, and you know, technically, um, you would think it should because there's so much more, uh, technology. I mean, for goodness sakes, they've got self-driving cars now. You know, you'd think if they had self-driving cars that uh, that they would have better uh, types yeah. of, you know, uh, navigation uh, gear available for, for people who are uh, blind and visually impaired. But um, maybe maybe it's just that, you know, in a car you can fit an awful lot of computer in there to, to drive that stuff, whereas you can't in a portable device. But But who knows? Maybe we'll get there. Yeah, well, and I think that these guys are going to be interesting to talk to because they're doing something a little bit different from that. They're they're using the haptics, and and the, this device, you know, sort of ties in uh, the power of of Google Maps and and GPS and stuff. So, but yeah, we'll, this is this is a fairly straightforward device, and it's uh, I believe I'll, I'll leave it to them to fully explain it. But I but I believe from what I've read about it is it's meant to just give you directional information, which way you need to turn at, at what point. Um, and it, and it gives it to you in a nice discreet, um, uh, haptic method. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's just trying to be a, uh, an accessory that, um, keeps you from having to wear headphones to, uh, to get that kind of information. Right. All right. Well, uh, well, before we launch into that though, we should address an email that we got from Robert G, who writes us, Gentlemen, after listening to episodes 72 through 74... Okay, let's stop you right there. Yes. I know who Robert G is. I mm-hmm. worked with Robert G years ago, and he should not, know better than to include me in the not, word gentleman. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. No, oh, it is in quotations. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> gentlemen, after listening to episodes 72 through 74, I just had to drop you a line. It is so nice to hear that Steve was able to snatch his career from the jaws, and it's capitalized, of defeat. Nicely done. <laughs> to his now successful business. Your podcast is absolutely brilliant in capital letters. Woohoo! This man, he's, he's on fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, good stuff. Uh, who would have known? Wait, did he say brilliant or brilliant? No, he said brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, okay. Let's see, gotcha. it's a play. It's a play <laughs> yeah, on yes, the device, is. right? Yeah, there okay, we go. So. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, who would have known? That such diverse information could emanate from the Guitar Dungeon. Yeah, who knew? Hope to hear from you soon in whatever medium you choose, Robert G. How about this one, Robert? There you are. Nicely done. Nicely done. And well done on the puns, sir. Indeed. We also got an email from a Michael B. 
who is also a fellow podcaster, who says, Hey, Ryan, just wanted to drop you a quick message to let you know that I am loving the podcast. Keep it up. And uh, me and Steve will just say, Oh, okay. Yeah, good job, Ryan. Good job, Ryan. Yeah. All right. Woo, yeah. Ryan. Yeah. Oh. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Michael B. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> You're my number Obvi- one fan. Obviously a Ryan fan right there. Uh, no, thanks, guys, for the emails. They're much appreciated. Okay, okay. Here, Here's a good one. Uh, London, British police say an alleged thief was found covered in Doritos beside a half-eaten pie after he broke into a house and then <laughs> fell asleep. Hmm. That's awesome. Monksland police in Scotland tweeted, we all feel tired when we start a shift and a thief who started his shift at 2345 Monday was no different. It said the alleged burglar broke into a house, decided on a pit stop, ate half a pie and fell asleep covered in Doritos. He there woke he up is. in cuffs. <laughs> That's great. All right. We got the doorbell. Hello. Hello Bye. there. Hello. Hey guys. <laughs> so sorry about that. No, no, no it's no okay. It's just Skype. <laughs> Skype's been really stupid today. Well, we just had a message pop up on screen here. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it uh, it said that your uh, internet connection is unstable. Who's is mine? It? I don't know. It just said your internet connection is unstable. It was very it? vague. Oh. I don't know who it was blaming. Yeah. Okay. Could be, <laughs> well, Could we're, be us. We're but no, you're, wired, you're, but... you're actually coming in way better than with Skype. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I, I went and downloaded the, the Skype on my computer, and it wouldn't let me open it because it was like, your version is outdated. Oh, like, I know. I know. Skype yeah. is just, it's on its, <laughs> way, it's on its way out. I think we may just start switching to Zoom. Yeah, uh-huh. there's there's a lot of other options out there. And, yeah. and uh, Skype, the only reason Skype's still popular is that they bundle it in and they make you use it. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, joining us today is Mr. Keith Kirkland, who is the CEO and co-founder of WearWorks. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, actually, give me a second. I have to, I'm unprepared. Yeah, we're so, we're so baffled with the connection issues that we're completely unprepared <laughs> through, to talk to you. Through the entire <laughs> show off. Anyway, we'll... Uh, well, listen, tell us a little bit about the company and uh, just what the, what the genesis of it was and, and how you guys decided to go down the haptic route yeah no worries um so um we started WearWorks back two years ago um it was actually around two years ago at the beginning of october so we just crossed over our two-year anniversary and when we first came together um i have there's three of us so there's me i'm the ceo and my my co-founder kevin Yu. um He's the chief of design and my co-founder, Yang Wang, or Yang Wang, um, he's the head of manufacturing and like operations. And so when we first came together uh, to explore this route in haptics, we actually took three very different paths to get here. Um, and so my background was in, um, we all met at Pratt Institute in the industrial design program there. Young and I were both doing the master's program and Kevin was doing the bachelor's program. And I spent the entire year working on a suit. Um, I was trying to create a suit that you can download Kung Fu into and the suit would teach you Kung Fu. And cool. I, Wait, uh, Steve's and, head just snapped up. You just <laughs> you got Steve's attention right there. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> exactly. It's like, exactly. Okay, <laughs> why are you not working on this still? All right. I, I want oh, a Kung Fu exoskeleton. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things that I realized in the process is that all the technology to make the suit exists right now. Like I, I could have one today essentially. Um the one part that was missing, um, and I didn't foresee this going into it, was this idea of I was going to try to use haptics to kind of like communicate information that the movement instructor would usually be there to to, to critique. And so, if you look at it, like um, um, I was dating a woman, and she was a yoga instructor, and um, one day I was hunched over my computer. And she kind of put like one finger in my spine and she put the other finger like on my right shoulder and she kind of pushed into my spine and pulled at the finger on my shoulder. And I kind of straightened my back out to kind of like proper posture. And then it made me realize, I'm like, well, if you had a way to tell what my movement was, motion capture data, you had a way to tell what my movement should be, the motion capture data of some kind of professional. And you had something that could simulate that push to haptic motors 
you could essentially simulate this whole experience without the teacher needing to be there. Mm-hmm. And then it became like, you know, right now movement is still taught in a way that like music used to be listened to before the invention of the phonograph. You know, like if I wanted to hear you play trumpet, I had to sit in the room with you. And so the suit all of a sudden created like the possibility of like what happens when like, you know, like someone can download your Kung Fu training program in Brazil and they've never met you, never seen you even. Um, and what does that do to like the movement economy, um, capturing and digitizing movement? And so this was like all the stuff that I was thinking about, um, mainly because I was interested in movement, but also mainly because I have a lot of injuries from movement, you know, like two partially torn rotator cuffs had me do two shoulder surgeries, a herniated disc in my lower back, a, uh, you know, partially torn Achilles. And so from skateboarding and so. I realized that like if there was a better way to learn movement so that I didn't have to be taken out the game when I injured some important muscle group that was involved in that movement. And thus now I need to go find a whole new like thing to find fall in love with. Um, and so that's how I got into the space of haptics was realizing that like if I want you to raise your wrist off of the table two inches, do I put a motor at the bottom of your wrist and vibrate it or do I put a motor at the top of your wrist? Like none of that work had been done before there was no language to communicate movement information through touch. And so I realized that before the suit could even be made, this language first needed to be created. And that became where me and my co-founders all kind of came together. So we were all applying for this thing called America's Greatest Maker. It was a, it was a television show based around wearables with a million dollar top prize. And originally I was going to enter with my suit and my two co-founders were going to enter. They had been interested in the space of haptics. They've been working with some haptic companies. Um, Kevin had been working with like wearables, um, doing like high end wearable tech stuff for brands like Coach and Rebecca Minkoff. Um, Young had come from the space of mainly like 3D modeling, but he also has background as like kind of like as a DJ and an audio engineer. And so we were using a lot of those kind of ideas of music and translating them into touch. And so for us, they reached out to me um, and we all had individual relationships as well. Kevin and I worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art together in a program called the Media Lab, where we basically explored technology at the intersection of the museum experience. And we basically both kind of created projects that got a lot of attention. Um, I was using, garments to like walk down runways and 3d modeling them with 3d models so you can see what the garments in the museum look like worn on a person and kevin had spent he was he was trying to explore how to take an art in other senses and so he worked with a company that was doing like printing 3d prints and sugar and so we printed he printed some uh artifacts from the museum and wanted to, people to be able to taste them um and so that's kind of like where me and Kevin relationship started. Kevin and Young have a furniture company that they've been working on together for a few years now doing custom like pewter uh, furniture. And then Young and I were all classmates. And so we had a, a good working relationship with each other. And we were all also in this group called the Digital Arts and Humanities Research Center. We call it the DARK uh, at Pride Institute, which is kind of a space to kind of, you know, like bring in some more of this kind of like technology, creative, technology and creative stuff kind of together. And so that was like our intro. And so they reached out to me and was like, hey, we're gonna do, we're gonna enter this competition using haptics and you did haptics all year, you wanna join. And I had a really good relationship with both of them. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so when we came together originally, the original goal was that um, we weren't sure exactly what we were gonna do. We know we wanted to do something in haptics. Um, And I felt like the suit was way too complicated to do. It was a lot of moving pieces Um, A lot of the technology wasn't fully there yet. And so we looked at like, what could we do with this technology and how could we start to begin to create the foundation of this language? And we kind of ultimately decided on navigation and navigation was a really good premise because unlike the Kung Fu suit, which needed three dimensions, navigation, you only really need two, right? You know, it's a top view Um, outside of needing millimeter accuracy in real time with GPS, you get like five meter, five meter accuracy and you can have a bit of a lag. It's acceptable in that space. And so, and the commands are really simple. It's go straight, turn left, turn right, wrong way, you've arrived, you've begun. Um, And so we felt like this was like a really good use case to put kind of, to prove that we could net, we could, we can take information 
and communicate it through another sense. And that's kind of what we've always been about is this idea of like everything is so visual and then secondary is audio, you know, like right. what can we do? Like, you know, like with touch, you kind of have the same sensitivity that you have with like the eyes or the ears, but you know, it's for every 100 papers written on vision, there's one written on touch. It's, 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 it's extremely kind of like underexplored and underutilized as a communications medium to get information. And so we felt like what was being designed on the floor is kind of like cell phone notifications, right? And then on the, on the higher end, what could be done is that like you can tell the difference between love or aggression in an instant. You know, you get punched in the face, you don't really need to have all the facts to understand that like something just happened, it wasn't great, and like your brain <laughs> responds. And so right. we were like, if the body is capable of this, and people are only basically designing with this, these buzz buzz on offs, like we just felt like there was so much space to play in. And so we kind of walked into this idea, like, okay, like let's create a way to originally we walked in, we're like, let's create a way to get people out of their phones and back into the real world. And that was our that was our beginning. So it really, it sounds like you, you didn't necessarily take, uh, you know, uh, the route of we're going to design something that's going to be a mobility aid for the visually impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's kind of sounds like you guys just kind of fell into that space. Is that, is that right? Is, yeah. I mean, you, a bit of it, like we, we knew navigation was a really good topic and we knew that the blind and visually impaired community could probably benefit best from what we were doing. And so the, we had those assumptions really clear going in, um, but we, we we obviously had our concerns. Like we had never done this before and, and, and it had never been done before. And so right. we were like, okay, let's prove it with people who can see first, you know, like, cause there's that whole liability factor where it's like the last thing you want to do is navigate someone to like a dangerous situation. Um, you lose trust instantaneously. And basically, you know, we might be selling haptic devices, but really what we're doing is we're selling trust. You know, we're selling trust that people, that we can get people to the end destination that they put into the device. Right. Um, and it only takes, it only takes one or two times to like, to lose that trust completely. And so we've been very, very sensitive to that. And so our goal was kind of like, yeah, we'll get to the blind community eventually, but let's start where people can see first, let's prove out the concepts, get it all working. And then by the time we get it to the blind, we'll know that it really, 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 really works really, really well. Right. Um, and so that was our initial walk into it. And then that all got completely flipped around. You know, um, we ended up, we didn't get America's Greatest Maker um, um, due to a scheduling conflict, which is like the saddest reason oh. to lose something. <laughs> um, and what we did though, we took, the, we took the same info and we applied to this, this organization, to this, uh, this competition called Next Top Maker. And it was a New York Economic Development Corporation sponsored uh, program um, in partnership with like Microsoft and Nike and a, and a few other companies in New York. Um, and the goal was that they wanted to turn New York into like the Silicon Valley of hardware. Hmm. And so they got tired of kind of losing tech talent to, to San Francisco and the Bay Area. And it was like, what can we do to create an ecosystem here in New York to make tech, especially hardware companies, want to stay here? And so we came in on the third cohort of that program. They gave us about, you know, $10,000 as grant money. And, you know, we got started. And so, um, you know, when, when, we, when we walked in, we walked in with a video. And we had some really, really rough prototypes of what we thought it might be like. And other than that, we basically had nothing. And when we left, you know, like we left because uh, we saw the other companies that we were competing against to get that one of those six slots. And they were so far along. It's like, this company was like, we make giant 3D printers and here's our giant 3D printer. Not like, here's a video of our giant 3D printer and how it might work, you know? And so, <laughs> right. I mean, we, we basically just like went and got like, you know, totally trashed at a, a bar nearby because we thought we did <laughs> such a horrible job. And then a week later we got a call and was like, congratulations. Like we want you guys um, to, to join the program. And so like, we were like ecstatic. Um, and it kind of like validated like, oh, this could be potentially be like a really real thing. And so that first money and that recognition, they gave us office space. And part of that was a, uh, an exhibition booth at South by Southwest. And so we went down to South by Southwest. And when we got there, we were trying, we're having everyone try to device. We figured out an algorithm that could, nav that could orient people towards the correct direction. And it was so intuitive that we didn't even have to give them instructions. We just told them to spin around 
And then we tell them to spin again and like stop in the direction you think is the right way to go. And 90% of the people can get it within about 20 seconds. Wow. No prior experience with the device, you know, and they've never ever heard of a device that can like navigate a person with haptics. And so completely novices in the space. And, and that's what we were looking for. Cause the thing about creating a language is that like, you know, I started learning Swedish. I went to Sweden about a month ago and I started learning Swedish about 50 days before that. Cause I wanted to see how far I can get in Swedish before I went to Sweden. And I got, decently far i mean i mean nowhere near being able to understand conversations and, and and much but but i got i got far enough where i was like oh this is this is really interesting because you have to learn all these nuances of the language and the pronunciation and the formats mm-hmm. and the we were trying to avoid all of that and we wanted to create an experience that was just kind of like like a kiss or being punched in the face where you could just recognize instantaneously like something happened and it was good or bad i should do this or not um and so while we were at South by Southwest, one of the guys that we were testing the device out with happened to be uh, a teacher for the school, for the, the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And when he tried on a device, he was like, you have to take this to the blind school. And we were leaving mm. like five o'clock in the morning and it was like maybe 3 p.m. when we met him and the school closed at five. So we basically packed up everything and ran to the school. Um, when we got there, uh, we met the superintendent of the school, but the school was totally closed because they were on spring break. Oh. Um, but the great thing was that is that the Texas Department for Assistive and Rehabilitative Services, Blind Services Division, was right around the corner. And so they directed us there. And when we got there, um, we, we basically walked up to some people in the parking lot and was like, we started showing them the device and, and, and apparently because it's like, you know, like you have to do this silly thing where you have to spin around so you can feel the whole experience of the device so you can understand what, what your choices are. Right. And apparently making people spin in a circle, make them become your friends because <laughs> you walked in, they were kind of like, what do you want? I'm like, oh, we're looking to speak to somebody about this. And it was like, yeah, go ask someone at the front desk. Once they tried everything out, they was like, you need to speak with Scott Bowman. He's the assistant commissioner. Like his office is right here, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we walked in to ask for Scott. And we ended up being guided to his office by five of his employees. And he had no idea we were coming, you know, like, and so he just kind of like, in, like in shock. And I felt like, oh, like, I remember that moment of kind of like having to diffuse the whole situation. Like, yo, I know this looks crazy. Hi, my name is Keith, <laughs> uh, from where it works. And here's what we're here to do. Yeah, and I want you to spin in a circle. <laughs> he, was, he was phenomenal. You know, like he gave us like four hours of his time. He let us borrow some of his employees who were like, who have visual impairments. They tried the device out. He let us video record them. Um, so, you know, we got their really honest feedback. And at that moment, we were, you know, uh, Kevin's father uh, um, was kind of, uh, has, has become famous for saying that, um, you know, like he was talking about, you know, like who we should do this device for. And he always thought we should do it for the, for the blind. And we were hesitant because we weren't, we didn't want to do with the liabilities around it just yet. So he was like, yeah, you know, Maybe somebody traveling, you make their life 15% better, right? He's like, maybe if you're talking to someone who's like running or like cycling through the city or like hiking on a trail or snowboarding down a trail, like maybe 25% better, right? And then but like when, when we put the device into the hands of like people with like, you know, blindness and visual impairments, it was, it was like, you can just see their eyes light up. It, it, it was like, it was kind of like order of magnitudes change in life right and and the quality of life and that's when we got really clear like okay this is the hardest possible thing we can do but if we do it if we're successful we prove without a shadow of a doubt that every single other use case that we've ever wanted to explore with the same technology is is trivial and so then we became like okay cool let's just do the hardest thing um and that's kind of how we started our direction into focusing explicitly on the blind amazing and so the device itself it's it's called the wayband correct yes that's correct so can can you so for our listeners who don't know anything about it um <laughs> sort of take us through what the device is and and what it can do and, and how it kind of works okay perfect um so the device is called wayband and it's a wearable haptic navigation device um, you wear it on your wrist, and uh, the device has no screens. Um, we wanted to keep it as kind of like minimal and as simple as possible. And plus, all of my co-founders and I have backgrounds in industrial design, so you know, of course, that kind of like beauty and that like aesthetic part is like very, very important to us. Um, and also, we found out to a lot of our our blind users 
um, they actually care a lot more about how things look than people with sight, which is kind of like a misconception that sighted people have. Um, and so, and more than anything, we know that the quality of, is, is basically in how the device feels. And so we're paying really close attention to those details. Um, but as far as functionality is concerned, like you put the device on your wrist, it connects Bluetooth via an app that we designed uh, right now only for iOS, um, but we're gonna bring out an Android version um, after we kind of work out all the, the, the bugs and kinks. Right. And um, the goal is, is, so you wear the device, it connects via Bluetooth and you, in, you interact with the app. Right now, uh, we built the app that it works with voiceover. So most people, most blind people and visually impaired people are familiar with using uh, Apple's accessibility voiceover feature, which mm-hmm. kind of reads off kind of like options on the screen. Um, and so we built the app so that it worked with voiceover. Um, we also built like an app sighted in case people have some type of level of sight because we know visual impairments, the range is very, very huge of what people can actually see. So we made a fully sighted app as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that can also, uh, you know, um, that, yeah, that works with voiceover. And then ultimately the goal is, is to integrate voice recognition so that a person can speak directly into the device and have all the, the instructions go directly, um, all their routes mapped out. Um, and so right now, um, once you kind of like input your destination, the, 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 the device is like, it's almost like a, um, we know where you are based on your GPS and we know the next intersection that you need to turn at, right? So you draw a line between those points, you know, you get a straight line. And so because our technology allows us to orient people, we can orient you along that line. And then when that dot is acquired, um, the route dynamically changes to orient you towards the next line. And so we basically have figured out a way to guide people to an end destination. We don't need any visual or audio cues at all. And it's really, really intuitive. Very cool. So are you guys using like Google Maps technology or what GPS technology are you using? Um, right now we're, we're leveraging, we built our app on top of uh, uh, open on, on, a, on a platform called Mapbox. Um, we, the GPS technology is kind of like we're leveraging the GPS right now that's in cellular phones, um, which has an inherent kind of inaccuracy built in um, into the device, especially kind of dealing with cities. Um, which has been a huge, huge nagging problem for us because for a sighted person, you know, being, being, you know, 10 meters off isn't such a big deal, but like for a blind person, like that's a huge, huge, that's very significant. Right. And, um, and, you know, we just got, we just got wind that uh, some GPS, G, more accurate GPS chips are coming to smartphones starting next year. That's yeah. right. Yeah. They have a range of about 30 centimeter accuracy. Um, so that's going to do wonders because eventually um, we'll be able to get to the point where we can navigate a blind person to the door handle, right? Um, which is all to, which is really what is needed. Is that that last thirty feet is 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 really is the really 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 challenging part yeah. um, for us, you know, for them. Um, but for now, while we're dealing with five meter accuracy GPS, we're trying to figure out ways to mitigate uh, the confusion that happens, especially in cities. Um, Every building basically acts like a magnetic. Every build, every large metal structure is is a is a detraction from magnetic north to a mm. compass. So you walk across a bridge and you'll just see like your compass is just scrambled. You know, it's like, um, and so we're kind of looking at like some really innovative software algorithms that can like smooth out a lot of that data until we get to the point where we have the accuracy that we need, kind of already existing in a technology, but. Um, one of the things I like to I like to to specify is that like at WearWorks we're really interested in like products and experiences designing products and experiences that communicate information through touch. So mapping isn't really our specialty. You know, GPS isn't our specialty. Um, we're not even necessarily assistive technology. We're more in- inclusive design because we happen to pick a sense that more people have access to. Right. Um, and so, as the, as the technology gets better, our device will get better. But right now we're 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 doing a, a bit of legwork to figure out how to mitigate that inaccuracies that are inherent in the system. Tell us about the uh, beta program and how that works. Yeah, so the beta program is a, a, a concept that we came up with. Um, we really wanted to get feedback, and we've worked really really closely with blind organizations like 
you know, we've been consulting with a, the former CEO of, of Dallas Lighthouse. Um, she's a, a, she's become kind of like an integral part of our team. Um, you know, we, we have some blind consultants that we've been working with. Simon, of course, who ran the race. Um, he ran the New York City Marathon with our device uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, um, National Federation of the Blind, uh, Lighthouse Guilds in New York City. So we've been talking and we've been building this technology and this device alongside the blind community. Um, and what we needed to do is that we really needed to get these devices out there, you know, like, and the hard thing about developing hardware is that you need a thing to be relatively finalized and finished before you can get it out there to people. Right. Um, and every, 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 every month that we delay is a month that someone could be navigating with our device, you know, like that their life could be better. And so like, we're really kind of pushing around the boundaries and, and, and especially like we're trying to push the deadlines. And one of the things that we realized was is that like we really needed to get a lot of data. And so we were like, okay, let's create a program where we give people access to the devices, the early state devices, the same one that Simon ran the race with. Um, and right now, the, as the program stands at, at 299, you get like the beta device. And we, we, we're selling it as a program specifically because it's like, it's not a device. It's not a finalized thing. We know it needs more work and we're gonna, and the whole point of this program is to figure out where those resources are best spent by getting the feedback of people who are actually gonna be using these devices you know, in their regular lives. And so um, the part of the beta program is we're selling it as a program because we want people to give us feedback. Um, so part of the program is a one hour either phone call or visit if you're close enough um, with one of the founders um, to talk about the experiences with the device. And so the idea is that we want to do one hour per person over the course of four months uh, for each of the four months. And then the data that we should have from everyone traveling with the device, all the feedback is then going to go into a new pool at about month four to redesign or refine the device with the features and feedback that, you know, our original 100 beta users gave us. Um, and then after that, to come out with the finalized device and some type of pre-order campaign or crowdfunding. So that's how we're moving. Um, and so the beta program is really a way to, for us to like really get intimate with the relationships and, and really to, because uh, the other part is that uh, you, you need to log a lot of miles to get the data because our device requires that you cover large geographical distances. And so, you know, we, on one end, it's like if we had 10 people do, if we had a thousand people, if we had a hundred people do, you know, 10 miles, we have a thousand miles logged. Whereas then like for the founders to do it, we'd have to run out, we have to go out and travel 333 miles each, you know what I'm saying? To get the same amount of data. Right. And then the other part is that like, we want to really see across different spectrums. Like, you know, how does someone who's 15 uses the device versus someone who's 75? Um, how does the device perform in, in non-city areas? Uh, how does it perform in rural and suburbs? Um, you know, like how does it perform like at higher altitudes versus low altitudes, humidity? Like we need enough geographical data to really be able to understand like fully what people's experience of this thing might be um, before we go into our redesign phase. And so that was our way of really just kind of like involving our customers even 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 more so to to give them kind of like a direct line of communication to us so that we can really make a device that's actually going to impact their lives. Um, sort of going back to the the actual design of it um, and, and and haptics in particular, what are the advantages of of using haptics as a, a navigation aid as opposed to, say, something like speech? Like, you know, there, there are a lot of um, yeah. mobility GPS apps out there that will that will speak to you, obviously. Um, yeah. What's the advantage of, of using haptics in that instead of speech? Yeah, um, so the biggest advantage that we see as opposed to audio is that for a person, especially for a person who's blind or visually impaired, your ears are like your eyes. Like, that's how you understand what's going on around you. That's how you keep yourself safe. Um, and we feel that the audio now navigation, which is a really, really great aid for blind people right now. And, and you know, we have totally no, nothing against it, of course, you know, we might actually incorporate some audio prompts 
on top of our haptics. We're exploring that possibility. Um, but the thing about audio is that like it takes away a blind or visually impaired person's ability to hear what's going on in their environment. And then like, you know, you know, God forbid something in the in the space is way too loud and now you miss your direction. And when you're lost, it's it can be a really big challenge or big confusion part to kind of get back, back on track. Right. And so the way the the real big advantage we see to using haptics is that A, you get um you get the information communicated to you while still being able to like fully use your ears to pay attention to what's going on around you. And then the second part is, is that the information is really discreet, you know, like right now, um, you know, like I've had a, I've had a, a, a few conversations with blind people where it's like, you know, like basically they feel like their most accessible devices right now, basically like Bluetooth headphones and like iPhones. Right. Yeah. And because that's the device that they use mainly through life. And so, you know, she was talking about how embarrassed she was one time where she got a text message, like, you know, from her husband that was like slightly inappropriate. And she thought it was on her Bluetooth headphones, but it was actually like on speakerphone, <laughs> yeah, okay. you know, like, and so like giving people like the other part of the thing is that when we went to the National Federation of the Blind, we walked in with like very blind specific stuff. We were like, we took a pivot and we were like, let's, why are we building a separate device? Let's put all this stuff into a cane. Blind people use the cane all the time. Why not just build it into what they have instead of making them go out and get something additional? And then we walked in and one of the guys at the National Federation of the Blind, it was, it was pretty funny. He was like, uh, he was guiding us to the room. It was a maze. So the fact that he could even find this room was amazing. Um, it was totally amazing. We were like lost. And he's, while we're walking through the space, he was like, yeah, you know, every year someone comes in here with some technology like to replace our blind cane. It's so stupid. And we're just like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> stupid. You know. And, <laughs> meanwhile, we had a whole bag full of stuff to replace the blind cane with. You know, like, and so we eventually we showed them. You know, we we fessed up and we showed them that we were kind of we were trying to come in here and replace the blind cane, and they liked the work that we had done, but they were way more interested because, you know, like we uh, the the stuff we were doing with the blind cane was around like proximity, like being able to detect stuff around you. Like we call it like, you know, like we have like. So we're working on like macro scale navigation, right? Uh, for the wayband, but like, this is kind of more like micro scale, like avoiding obstacles and people in front of you. And so they weren't really interested. They was like, this is cool, but like, we know how to get around. We figured that out. They was like, this other thing is a real problem. Like solve this. This is, this is actually hard for us. Figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so we like, okay. And, and then the other thing that they told us is that they was like, look, it was like, don't make a device for blind people. You know, like, you know, like she was like, my, my braille keyboard is a tool for me. I, I love it. It is a tool. It is a necessity. I need it. Right. She's like, but my most accessible devices are my iPhone and my Bluetooth headphones, something that are not geared toward blind people specifically, but they work really well for blind people. So, so what they told us is like to keep their use case at the, at our forefront, but to design it a device that anybody could use because ultimately one of the reasons that blind technology ends up being so expensive is because it ha all the research and development costs have to be like amortized over over a much smaller population um and so we're looking at ways to kind of like okay that tech that kind of brings us back to our original plan which was like we wanted to build a device for anyone to navigate without having to use a phone and feel comfortable where they're going and so we're going to build it for blind people with all the specifications that we need to for blind people. But if you're a runner, you can pick one up. If you, if you're traveling to Thailand and you want to pull out your phone, you can also pick one up. And so that gives us a bit more range and a bit more scope to make sure that we can keep, you know, the price as, 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 as sensitive as possible to our community, you know, like, as I, th I think there's like a, a 60 to 70% unemployment rate in the United States, you know, like um, right. the median income is around like 30 to $35,000 a year. You know, this, this isn't a group that traditionally has a large disposable income. And, and we, we want to be really sensitive to that as much as we can. I can see this being a great driving technology too. There, there's a lot of uh, talk, at least here, about uh, distracted driving. They've just put through a mm. whole bunch of distracted driving laws. If you're even caught glancing at a, uh, at a handheld device here in British Columbia, um, wow! It's a what's the fine? I think it's, it's like three hundred and fifty bucks or something. Yeah, I think at least. Wow! Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty hefty fine. So, 
you know, if, if uh, people were uh, able to, to, you know, learn this and, and trust it as a navigation aid rather than looking at their phone, that would be a, that would be a pretty big boon. Yeah, exactly. And um, one of the, that, that's also one of the routes that we were interested in looking at. Um, and luckily, as it has it, that um, uh, we got into an accelerator program and Mini was one of our investors. And so, you know, BMW owns Mini. And so that kind of gave us access to to the, the inner workings of, uh, of BMW. Like we got to pitch the idea and the concept to the, to the chairman of BMW and they kind of gave us access to talk to like whoever we needed there to like try to solidify some partnerships or at least to gain knowledge that we didn't have around what we were doing. And um, there are lots of opportunities in the haptic space for automotive, definitely. Um, and then there's also the emerging market of kind of like the AR and VR experiences that are being created. Mm -hmm. Like to have fully immersive experiences, at some point you need touch, you know? And so ultimately what we're really trying to do is like we're trying to set ourselves up where we essentially become like what boasts us to sound is what we want to be for touch like anytime anyone thinks of like high quality touch-based design experiences they're looking at where it works because we're the best at it yeah um so that's like the ultimate vision but right now like hyper hyper focus on helping the blind and visually impaired communities because at, at the end of the day it's like we really feel like we can offer something to them that is actually really valuable and you know like adds to the ability for people to be more independent and more autonomous and and you know one of the things that you know like we we kind of like you know like like ray and charles Eames are like really famous industrial designers and you know kind of some of our heroes and they had this motto of like do the best for the most for the least you know and you know like we we like to hear like we believe in that that design as a vehicle you know, design as a vehicle to, you know, systemically change um, things that could be better that, to improve people's lives. And, and at the end of the day, that's that's what we're moving with as a forefront. So. Yeah. And do you do you find that like I know I know for us, um, it doesn't really feel like there are many people working in the realm of haptics. Uh, is, is that the case? Like you would you'd have a better idea, of course, but yeah. Um, no, there 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 surprisingly there are a few companies that are doing some really interesting things. Um, you know, like um, there's a there's a few other like haptic navigation devices out there. Um, some are geared toward the blind, some aren't. There's um, there's a few that a lot of work that that apple is doing actually with the the fact that they took the time to redesign their haptic experience and and, and develop the haptic engine is it's kind of like it's, it's showing it's, it's kind of like a showing of things to come of uh you know giving people access and the space and the tools to actually design with haptics and you know, that, that's something that we're interested in as well, because initially we were trying to create a platform that people can just develop their own haptic experiences, right? But, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like Apple made an iPhone and then they had to make their own example apps so that people could understand really what can be done with it. Right. You know, like, you know, like, and so they created Messenger and FaceTime and, you know, all the Apple apps that Apple has created within themselves. And then it's kind of like, here's the core apps that you get and now go and play. And so like we see Wayband as kind of like the beginning of, 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 of expanding the human ability to kind of like sense and understand its environment. You know, like right now, like we can only take in five senses because that's all that's been given to us. We have, you know, things that recognize light, things that recognize sound, things that recognize chemicals and the form of taste and, and, and smell and, and of course, you know, touch. Right. And so like, but if your eyes could see ultraviolet light, the way you move through life might be different. You know, like if, if, right. if your body could feel Wi-Fi signals and that concentration of signals either felt negative or positive, you'd move in a different way in life. But because we can't feel that information, we kind of think that is, you know, invisible, like almost a, like almost oblivious. And so, you know, like where there's a lot of opportunities um, to be to, to be explored in haptics. And I think right now there are companies that are coming on with product experiences, but there, there is no 
there's no haptic market leader right now. There's no person that's like, oh, those are the dudes that do haptics or those are the girls that do haptics. Like that doesn't exist right now. And one of the things that we're hoping to accomplish like with the work that we're doing is like, we want to become that leader. Like we want to become the place that people turn to when they're looking like, yo, who's doing dope stuff with haptics? Oh, that's these guys at where it works. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I think that even in the the general public, I think the idea of haptics is still sort of foreign to people. It, it really uh-huh. hasn't hasn't <laughs> entered into people's minds and it, and it is a, a really an untapped, an untapped realm. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, I'm impressed that, I mean, of course, I mean, you guys do assistive technology, so, but I'm impressed that you even know what haptics is, because, like, the very first thing that I usually have to do is explain the definition, (laughs) you know, like, that's how new of a concept that was, so, like, at at one point, I don't even, unless I'm talking with an audience that's really specific and understands, like, what haptics are, I usually just say, like, tactile, because no one under, no one understands what I'm talking about when I say haptics, you know, and so, and, and that's another thing like that. That's a bit more of the work that we have to do is kind of like we're also we're at the same time where we're selling the community and selling, you know, like the vision and the dream. We're also educating the community about it at the same time. You know, it almost goes hand in hand. So um, but we're really excited to do that. Like we're really excited that we get the opportunity because because no one knows what it means. It's kind of like a blank slate, like and it gives us the ability to kind of like fill our ideas of what we think it means on top of it to have that be the standard. And, you know, that's, that's a rare opportunity that you get to like the final word, you know, like it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So. Uh, well, why don't you tell people who might be interested in finding out more about the way band and about where it works, uh, where they can find you on the web? Yeah. So if you can go to www.where, W E A R dot works, W O R K S. Um, Right there, you can you can see we have right on the website uh, a link to sign up for the beta program. And if you're interested, we'd love to have you on board to test. We just ask that uh, if you're going to be one of our testers, that you know it's really important that you, we get the feedback from the community and that the community really kind of almost takes a you know a really active role in helping us to build this thing sure. because you know we're building it for the community. And so we just ask that anyone who will purchase a device is really committed to really helping like not just us but like really all blind people um to get a device that's going to be you know robust reliable and safe um that you know and so so yeah so please and and if you have any questions um you can shoot us an email at hello at where.works um and you know we've been kind of inundated with requests but we'll get back to you as soon as we can that's awesome. I, you know, and we'd love to have you back on in a few months and uh, just for an update and, and see see where things are at. No, that'd be fantastic, actually. Um, maybe sometime in March, we're scheduling to do a, we're scheduling around that time to be, to, to start um, preparing for our crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so, yeah, so sometime in March, we should have some really amazing updates for you guys. And like, GPS is like, you know, perfect now. And like, everything works great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know, um, I know for sure that you've got a sale for the Kung Fu suit. Um, oh yeah. Steve, yeah Steve's already oh, yeah, that, got that, his credit yeah, card yeah. out. So once you get that developed too. And... Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's coming. And my, about like in about three years, as soon as, as soon as we help blind people. <laughs> <laughs> my, my only, my only concern is what happens when uh, the suit can move further than I can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, technically, the suit would just let you know where you should be moving. Not... <laughs> yeah, Steve, it doesn't do all the work. It's not a... Idea. It seems yeah. a bit dangerous. I can just you know? see me in a typical workout. Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> God damn it. Further. Yeah. Further. Let's I can't go further. Stimulation and just activate people's muscles. <laughs> I can't there. put my leg there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds crazy. <laughs> Keith, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And, and good luck with, with uh, Wayband. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. And like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hit me up whenever. Sounds good. You bet. Okay, sir. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk to you again. Okay, cool. Ciao. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Cool. Kung Fu suit. Kung Fu suit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, God, what would that be like? Or a yoga suit? I mean, honestly, like haptics really is an untapped realm if you think about it. Like just think about even like you were talking about um, the car, 
Yeah. Like think about if they had built in haptics into a oh, steering wheel. I was thinking, I was thinking wheel. exactly that same thing. You know, and exactly if you're getting a buzzing, the, the closer you get to the vehicle in front of you and yeah. you're getting you're getting that tactile feedback on your steering wheel as well as your visual. I mean, it just it would add so much to to so many different yeah it's got potential for alertness you know for everything for, you know when if somebody's getting sleepy and they're starting to drift off the road it could you know vibrate the steering wheel to to wake you up it could give you directional information by vibrating one side sure. or the other you know it, there, there's all kinds of possibilities around that so yeah, yeah. It, the, these guys are are really on the forefront of a technology that's got a, a ton of potential yeah it because, really does because you think about it what what do we use haptics for now the about the only thing that the average person has in their life that uses haptics is their cell phone which right. vibrates and that's, yeah. that's it it's just a notification that hey your cell phone's Th that's ready. right he, he's absolutely right it was just an, it's just an on off thing yeah um, but I also think that the big advantage of haptics too, that he didn't really touch on, um, was it's far more intuitive than, than audio instruction as well. I would think, I mean, it's all about, you know, muscle memory. If, it, if you're talking about, uh, you know, it's, it's buzzing, say on the left side of the band mm -hmm. for you to go left. Yeah. Uh, you know, your, your, your mind processes that much quicker. Um, than say, uh, you know, audio instructions, oh, I think. Especially uh, for putts like me. I, I can't think of how many times somebody said, turn left, and I go, oh, okay, and they go, no, the <laughs> other left. <laughs> that's right. Uh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, that's left over there. So, yeah, yeah, haptics would probably do a better job of communicating that to me. <laughs> yeah, so it, it'll be interesting. You know, I, I think that, you know, in five years, I think haptics will be much, much larger because you have know, companies like these guys who are sort of, you know, making this stuff to really show what the potential is. Cause you know, the last thing that I, you know, I was kind of thinking about this while he was talking, I was like, well, what's the last really cool thing with haptics that, that, uh, I had in my life. And the only thing I could think of was like, I used to have one of those force feedback Steering joysticks. Wheels or joysticks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Joysticks like doing flight simulators and stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that was really cool. And that was all the rage there for a while. And then it just, even those like sort of just went away and, that's really the last thing that I could think of that, that really used haptics in that way. And I think that he's right too about, about VR and AR and, you know, building that element into, into entertainment as well. I mean, huge potential. Yeah. You know, he, he started talking about, uh, um, you know, the, the broader uses for it. And I started to think about, uh, you know, if you were in a, in an immersive movie theater, for example, you could you could be wearing a suit or something, and it would be giving you tactile information. And and the first thing that came to my mind is some son of a bitch is going to drop a spider on me. I'm going to feel that thing creeping up my arm, and I'm going to run screaming out of the theater. Ah, spider! <laughs> but that brings up a, that brings up a good point too, because that is some that is another place where they they are using haptics. Is there's have you heard of D box? Yeah. In the theaters? No. It's, uh, there, there are certain theaters that, that, uh, feature it and they're basically like they'll a haptic your, chair. Yeah. They'll oh, move yeah. your seat forward and backwards. They can shake it. Ah. Yeah. So, and you know, it's, so it hasn't really taken off. It's a bit gimmicky. Yeah. All right. Hey, Ryan. Rob. Where can people find us? As usual, they can find us online at www.atbanter.com. They can also email us if they would like to, uh, atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, they can. And you know where else they can find us? Where? They can find us on Twitter. We are at underscore banter at Twitter. And in Facebook, we are at banter. Correct, sir. Um, I guess that's it. Is it? That's I, a wrap. I think that's really? That, that is a wrap. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. I have been Rob Minot. And I've been Ryan Flurry. And I'll be Steve Barkley, I guess. We'll see everybody next week. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll free at 1-844-795-8324. 
For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778-847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com. Music provided by bensound.com.